We do love our cell phones, computers, and electronics. Until, that is, the latest upgrade replaces them, leaving a tidal wave of so-called e-trash in our wake. Until recently, much of that e-trash was shipped offshore, out of sight, out of mind. But that's changing. And so the messy task of dealing with the contaminants in our everyday devices will need to be dealt with here at home by Ontario workers. Joining us now for a look at what that means via Skype from Berkeley, California, Miriam Diamond. She's professor in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of Toronto. And here in our studio, Victoria Arendale, a scientist with Cancer Care Ontario's Occupational Cancer Research Centre. Uh, good to have both of you on our program tonight on TVO. Let's just share some of the fun facts, as we call them, uh, about this techno trash trouble that we're talking about tonight. In 2014, Canadians generated, imagine this, 724 million kilograms of e-waste. That's about 20.4 kilograms of e-waste per person. Almost 80% of Ontario residents live in a jurisdiction where e-waste is banned from landfills. And the projected worldwide e-waste this year is expected to reach 50 billion kilograms. So, Miriam, this is an issue, and we've got to figure this out. Apparently, China doesn't want our e-waste anymore, so we're going to have to take care of it here at home. Can you give us a sense about what we're going to do with all this stuff? You know what? I don't know. And <laughs> I think that not a lot of people know. The other thing that's important, you, you cited really good and, uh, statistics that are startling to most people. But that's what we know from last year and from a couple of years ago. What we also know is that the rate of e-waste generation is increasing a lot. It's increasing by about four times faster than the world's population growth. Hmm. So a lot of e-waste today and a lot more to come. And we don't really have ideas of what to do with it. Is this sort of one of the unanticipated, I mean, we all love our, you know, digital revolution devices and so on and so forth, but was this kind of an unanticipated byproduct of the digital revolution? Yes, I think it is. I mean, I think we're all sort of swimming on the um, economic, uh, the tide of economic success from internet technologies. They're really the engine of economic growth worldwide. But one of the unintended consequences is what do you do with all of it? So one of the aspects of, uh, and, and what's so exciting about internet technology is how fast it changes. Like it's changing incredibly fast. That means that both the software and the hardware become outdated quite quickly. But nobody's really thinking, well, actually, there are a lot of people that are very, very worried about the e-waste. But there's a disconnect. It's the disconnect between what's going on with the software and the hardware innovation and new generation versus the other people that are then left sort of literally holding the bag on what to do with the e-waste, scrambling to figure out what to do with the mass of stuff. In which case, Victoria, how well equipped are we here in the province of Ontario to deal with this burgeoning problem? It's a good question. Uh, we have a waste diversion program in the province, and right now our electronic waste is managed through that system, which is overseen by the Ontario Electronic Stewardship. And that program is how the e-waste is currently managed, and that program will be winding down in a couple of years as part of new regulation in the province. Uh, the Waste Free Ontario Act, uh, and the details of that are being worked out. So there's a bit of uncertainty, but hopefully there'll be a plan in place soon. Where does it all go now? Right now, it is collected at community events or taken back by retailers at the point of sale. And then the waste is processed uh, by companies in Ontario who dismantle it and sort it and then send it on uh, for recycling as best they can. So it doesn't end up in a landfill most of the time. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. That's the hope. But uh, I mean, we have uh, recycling plants, obviously, in the province of Ontario for other stuff. Mm -hmm. Does it have the capacity to deal with this stuff? I'm not sure what the capacity is. I think going forward, as Miriam notes, the volume is increasing. And I, I highly doubt that we have the capacity to deal with what's coming. And I think that's concerning for a lot of people. We, we put some numbers off the top about mm -hmm. what the volume is like. And it's, uh, you know, it's massive, mm -hmm. obviously. Miriam, I guess I should follow up with you on what are the kinds of specific contaminants that e-waste workers, I don't know what else we're supposed to call them, but e-waste mm -hmm. workers are going to be dealing with uh, 
here in the province of Ontario, now that we're not going to be shipping the stuff over to China anymore. Can you help us on that? Yes, I can. I just wanted to add one more thing about the, um, the generation of e-waste. It's unclear what numbers are being, uh, the, the massive e-waste being generated in Ontario and other jurisdictions. What we do have are collection numbers. What we don't know is how much is actually going offshore. Mm -hmm. What is being captured is used e-waste, but in fact it's junk and again gets shipped to low-income countries for uh, dismantling and, pro uh, and processing. So I really think that's an important aspect to add to the uncertainty. So why are we concerned with e-waste um, at all? Like why isn't it just sort of the same thing as, um, you know, stuff you put out on the curbside? Because it contains a lot of hazardous materials. That's why we're really concerned. Such as? E-waste. Yeah, e-waste contains like a cornucopia of metals. So, you know, some metals are not so bad, like zinc and copper, but other metals can be very toxic. In fact, for example, each cell phone contains uh, a quantity of gold. Um, in about 2013, there were almost 1 billion cell phones shipped worldwide that contained 14 tons of gold. Now, I mean, everybody has gold jewelry, right? I'm wearing gold jewelry today. But when gold is very, when it's disseminated, when, it's, when you chew on it or ingest it, which you shouldn't do, it can actually be quite toxic. There are other elements, like rare earth elements. We actually don't even know how toxic those elements are. Um, then there are um, retardants that are added to, for example, the motherboard and casings. Um, plastic uh, in, the, uh, in all e-waste contains uh, flame retardants. And again, we're, we know the toxicity of some of those flame retardants, and we're just finding out what the toxicity is of others. We're conducting an, an experiment in real time. Hmm. Okay, Victoria, this is probably self-evident, but let me just ask it to confirm. Is it because of all these uh, potentially carcinogenic contaminants that we can't just put these old cell phones in a landfill site? Absolutely. We can't just put them in the ground and hope for the best. Uh, we need to find a better way to, to manage them. Mm -hmm. Are we, I mean, I don't know if you know this yet, but uh, are we getting cancer because of our exposure to all of these things? Yeah, we, we don't know the answer to that question mm -hmm. right now. And, and, I, and I think those are questions that we need to ask, but we, we don't know the answer. Does yeah. Cancer Care Ontario have a view to the potential consequences of exposure to this stuff? Cancer Care Ontario is absolutely interested in modifiable and preventable causes of cancer and, and we need to know that something causes cancer before we act to, to, to prevent it. Sure. So I think we're interested in investigating it. Yeah. One can imagine, however, that if, if part of the job that future Ontario mm -hmm. workers are going to be doing is disassembling mm -hmm. in very fine detail all of these quite technical products, mm -hmm that workers are going to be exposed to some fairly nasty pieces of business. Mm -hmm. Is that cause for concern? I think it is cause for concern, and that's why we're exploring these issues in, in our ongoing research. Um, we know from studies in the environment that there are health effects associated with exposures to things like flame retardants, things uh, like endocrine disruption and neurological outcomes. So I think we have concern that these workers might be at risk. Um, but we just don't have the, the data to support that, so we're hoping to build that up going forward. Have you been in the recycling plants? Yes, we've been into one facility here in Ontario. Which one? And, uh, we're not at liberty to disclose Can that. Can you say but, where it is? Uh, no, it's in Ontario. It's just in the province? Yeah. Okay. What did you see when you were there? We saw workers uh, dismantling electronic waste and sorting it and uh, bundling it and sending it off to other facilities. Did it look safe to you? It looked safe. It looked like it was an emerging industry and uh, they were doing the best with the resources that they had. And, and I think it, it was eye-opening for us because we'd never been in a facility hmm. like that before. Are they wearing masks or gloves or anything like that? They're wearing a variety of uh, protective equipment. Uh, some workers were choosing to wear it and others were not, but certainly it was there. Mm -hmm. Miriam, can I ask you whether the recycled stuff from this e-waste is turning up in some unintended places. Yes, yes, definitely. Like what? So as, Vic as Victoria mentioned, just to give you a bit of the backstory on that, 
So when we went into the company, um, what we found is that they they seem to be working on quite a slim profit margin. And where they uh, obtain their profits is by dismantling parts of the electronics, and that includes everything from toasters and curling irons and uh, uh, lots of TVs that look like they were almost new. So they dismantle them. The the wiring goes for smelting in uh, in Quebec, where we have a smelter. And I think that's handled very responsibly. The plastic cases, for example, were bundled and at that time were shipped off to China because China had a vibrant market for purchasing the plastics from electronic cases. As I mentioned previously, those cases contain flame retardants, some of which have been banned due to health concerns, some of which may be banned because of health concerns, and others of which we're just trying to still figure out whether we should be concerned or not. So China has been, of course, the, um, the workshop of the world, making all sorts of um, devices and, uh, and products. So what we found and what others have uh, subsequently corroborated is that some um, new products can turn up with flame retardants in them. For example, my kitchen spoons. You know the black kitchen spoons they're kind of they're kind of large you know they're like about this big and yeah. they're colored black and maybe they're slotted or not or whatever anyways lots of people have black kitchenware um well my kitchen spoons happen to have flame retardants in them and also lead hmm. well how did the flame retardants get in my kitchen spoons because there are no flammability standards for kitchen spoons well what we think happened is that that the kitchen spoons were made out of a out of a t perhaps a TV case. It had seen a previous life as a TV case and were reincarnated as kitchen spoons. My colleague, Stuart Harrod, has subsequently followed this up in the UK, and we've done more sampling in, um, in Toronto with random kitchen spoons finding more flame retardants and uh, metals. You know, we're so, smiling here because it sounds funny, but, <laughs> but the fact is this is a story that goes well beyond just cell phones and TV sets, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does. And really what it speaks to is that we're creating so much waste. And what we want to do is, well, the first thing we should do is reduce how much waste we're producing. And we're doing a lousy job of that, frankly. The second thing we want to do is to recycle. So we think, oh, great. Well, we're going to take that, you know, plastic waste and turn it into a new product. Guess what? It turns into my kitchen spoon. Guess hmm. what? Not so great. I'm now being a to the flame retardants that were banned because we thought they were hazardous in the computer, but now they're in my kitchen spoons. And therefore going into all the food that you're cooking as well? Yeah, that's right. Hmm. Except they don't go there anymore because I got rid of my kitchen spoons. You got rid and of the kitchen spoons. where did they go? Spoon. To the landfill. Oh. <laughs> okay, this is, a, this is a bit of a mess here. I, I, um, okay, Victoria, tell me, what, because this sort of this kind of sprung upon us here uh, mm -hmm. when we kind of didn't expect it because China was buying all of our stuff and now they're not. Do, do we have the regulations in place yet in the province of Ontario that would govern uh, the safe recycling of all of what we've been talking about? It's complicated because there's lots of different realms in which this needs to be addressed through regulation. And I think that through things like the Waste-Free Ontario Act that's going to come into play, we're moving in the right direction in managing the waste. On the worker side, uh, we have an Occupational Health and Safety Act, which is very rigorous and provides uh, for a lot of protections for workers, but we need to ensure uh, that workplaces are following it and that workplaces are aware of the hazards in their, in their environment. And so I think there's a, there's a chance to do a better job. I think we have regulations in place and, and perhaps we can still improve upon them, but, but we have a good framework and I think we can work towards doing better. Did the regulations anticipate though that mm -hmm. some of these materials that are being recycled from cell phones are ending up in big black kitchen spoons and therefore potentially getting into our food? <laughs> Yeah, I think the short answer is no on that, right. <laughs> that we're, we're definitely lagging uh, in terms of how we cope with the secondary and tertiary uh, impacts of this type of waste. Miriam, are provinces adequately up to speed on what's going on here and, and therefore able to pass appropriate regulations or figure all this out? Well, I actually don't think so, but I, 
I don't think that, uh, I, I think the reason why is because it's hard to keep up with the pace of change. Mm -hmm. It's hard for governments to respond to such an enormous industry that on the one hand is uh, an economic powerhouse. And then on the other hand, we're, sort of the people, the province is left literally holding the bag on the e-waste. You know, side of this is, you know, can we adequately protect workers, for example? And Victoria spoke very well about that. But an additional side of that is that we don't have toxicity data on, for example, some of the chemicals that are replacements for what we found out were bad. It's incredibly difficult to keep pace with the rapid change of, of technological, I was going to say advancement, but I'm just going to use the word change because I'm not sure it's an advancement. Hmm. And are, are, are we doing a good enough job monitoring where these contaminants end up? No, uh, we're, we're not. And part of that is because the landscape changes so quickly and that science can't keep, keep up adequately. It's also a jurisdictional um, issue. So the federal government looks after uh, toxic chemicals and the provincial government looks after waste. And then there's sort of a gap between them. And then over off into sort of another side of things are standard development uh, agencies that develop, for example, flammability standards that's the reason why there are flame retardants, for example, in your computer and in your TV. And the flammability standard setting process is disconnected from toxic chemical management programs. So there's a hmm. lot going on, and it's very challenging for governments to keep a pace of this, also given the pressures of not wanting to increase taxes and to increase government capacity to deal with these problems. Sure. Okay, let's call this uh, final chapter of our discussion here a ton of prevention, T-O-N-N-E, because we want to be all metric and everything. Victoria, how much, I mean, we love our devices and we're not about to start giving up our devices and buying, uh, you know, one of those TVs, uh, flat screen TVs and all that stuff. We're not going to stop doing that. So how, how much can we mitigate the risk of, you know, getting cancer from these things? What do we do? Well, I think we can try to reduce our consumption. I think that is the first step at an individual level. But on the workplace side, we know how to reduce exposure in the workplace. And you talked about it a little bit earlier, putting on respirators, wearing gloves. I think that in the workplace, without knowing the risk or without knowing what the health impacts are, we can still reduce exposure in the workplace. I think we know how to do that and we can do that better. Um, for us as consumers, uh, I think it's, it's a little harder. I mean, reducing consumption, being aware of where your waste is going and being sure to follow uh, the recommended uh, routes for recycling. I think we can take some more personal responsibility for well, that. To that end, and I don't mean this as a facetious mm -hmm. question at all, I, I keep my Blackberry in my jacket pocket mm -hmm. all day long and it's sort of on my person all day. Yeah. Is that a dumb thing to do? I think the the risk we're still we're still not sure about the risk. I think that some folks would probably say, yeah, take it out of your pocket and put it on the table, <laughs> leave it in your bag, uh, and so that might be the precautionary approach. But I'm I'm not sure that we have the evidence. Where's your device yeah. right now? It's in my backpack. It's in yeah. your backpack over there, <laughs> so it is not on your person. Miriam, where's your device right now? And it's in my backpack. I do not have it on my person. Mm -hmm. I do not hold it there. Okay. For the record, then, there it sits. <laughs> I'm putting mine on the table. Uh, okay. We've, uh, it's very important to me that we don't leave th the wrong impression with people here, Miriam. And so I'm wondering whether or not you are suggesting that we all go home, go through our kitchens, and throw out all the black spoons that may have flame retardant and lead in them. Is that what you're suggesting? Well, what we found is that one-tenth of the black spoons had flame retardants and lead in them. Um, it, I do not use my black spoons. And what I also do is I try not to flip my devices quickly. So I think our conversation today, as Victoria pointed out, is about prevention. And one of, that, one of those lines of prevention is holding on to each device longer, not using so many devices, questioning whether the smart device is really smart, how long it's going to last, and really understanding 
all the, well, at least getting a, a, a picture into the unintended consequences of our so-called smart devices that are maybe not so smart from a long-term environmental and health perspective. That, that is asking a lot of people who have really had it ingrained in the culture that as soon as that next iteration of the iPhone or the next iteration of whatever comes out, you gotta be lined up around the block like everybody else to get it right away. You're, you're telling people not to do that, um, how's that going to go over? I am, and I'm unapologetic about it because I'm talking about the future for our kids and their kids. And what I want for uh, the future is to have a safe environment. And that means reducing the amount of electronic devices that we use every day and that are coming online every day. We're using a lot of resources that go into the electronic devices. We cannot adequately and sufficiently recover and recycle all those elements. And as we process and try to do the recycling, we use a lot of energy and it makes a big environmental mess. Hmm. So unfortunately, you know, you just can't have your cake and eat it too all the time. Understood. Uh, Victoria, are manufacturers making smarter devices, whether they're fridges or stoves or whatever, that don't have uh, as many problematic mm -hmm. properties in them as, say, some of the ones made in the past? I think they think they're making smarter devices, but I'm not sure from a uh, recycling or reducing, reusing perspective, they are. I'm not sure that they're considering it. And I think that that's something we haven't touched on yet, but that incorporating that end of life portion uh, into the manufacturing process and into their planning is a really important thing that we need to do. I, I don't think it's there right now. And can you imagine that people are going to not champ mm -hmm. at the bit to get that next iteration of their favorite device uh, because they may have watched this broadcast? I hope that we can change a few people's mind. I, I agree with you that it's hard. It's We're marketed to, to want that. Um, but we need to think about whether we need it and oh. whether we're prepared to deal with the consequences. Kids alone are very competitive. Mm -hmm. You know, every time somebody in class mm -hmm. has the next, I don't know what number they're up to now, is it 7.0 or 8.0 or whatever, mm -hmm. somebody wants the next one. Yeah. What do you do about that? I think you have to decide whether you're going to buy into that culture mm -hmm. or not and, and take actions that support your, your thoughts and your feelings on that. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going home right after this program to throw out my black spoons. So in the meantime, I want to thank all of you for coming on the program. Uh, Miriam Diamond from the University of Toronto, uh, on Skype from Berkeley, California. Thanks so much, Miriam. And Victoria Arendale from Cancer Care Ontario. Great to have both of you on TVO tonight. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.